What's up guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What was that? There was no coffee in the intro. <laughs> what is this? It's a whole new world! <laughs> Don't worry, we still love coffee we and we still drink coffee. But we wanted to change up the intro because it is 2023. We want to yeah. do something fresh, something new. So how'd you like it? Comment below. What are we discussing in today's video? Today we are going to discuss El Nino and La Nina. We're in the La Nina pattern right now, it's been there for a few years um, and now it's starting to make its transition according to scientists, so we'll see what happens here in the next few months. But uh, we're going to talk about those two weather patterns, how they affect the area of the globe, especially over here on the United States side, and uh, compare the two as well. Exactly, and if you are sitting at home currently thinking to yourself, El Nino, La Nina, never heard of that before. Stick around, don't worry, we're going to do a deep dive of that. But before we get started. <laughs> Why did you do that to me? <laughs> don't forget to give us a thumbs up and don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. Why not subscribe? You're watching us anyway. You get content like this every week <laughs> or every other week. <laughs> Sometimes on a Tuesday, you know? Life is busy, okay? <laughs> also, while you're subscribing, check out our School of Weather, which is linked in the description box if you are interested in learning about the basics of meteorology, but you're not sure if you want to go to school for it. We have a series of online courses that basically goes into what you would learn in a college level intro class. So those will be linked in the description if you want to check that out. One other thing we want to mention is also how these weather patterns affect hurricanes and tornadoes. Where'd your jacket go? Uh, I took it off. It's over here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right into it. What's El Nino? What's La Nina? El Nino and La Nina are climate patterns that set up over the Pacific Ocean and can affect the weather on a worldwide scale. A typical or normal climate pattern across the Pacific sets up where trade winds blow westward along the equator. These winds tend to blow the warm surface waters of the Pacific westward from South America toward Asia. As the warm surface waters move westward, that water is replaced by colder, deeper waters off the South American coast. This process is called upwelling. In addition, the jet stream sets up shop in its typical or normal position during these times of normal patterns. In an El Nino pattern, the trade winds weaken, allowing the warm surface waters to remain along the South American coast. The warmer waters make the jet stream shift to the south of its normal position and extend further eastward as well. This shift impacts the climatological patterns across the U.S. and Canada. As you can see, an El Nino pattern will bring drier and warmer than usual conditions to the northern U.S. and Canada, while wetter and normal conditions occur across the southern U.S. If there is sufficient rainfall over a long period of time, flooding occurs in these areas as well. Why is it called El Nino? Why, why are we calling it Spanish words? What does this mean? So in El Nino, the reason is because back in the 1600s, fishers in South America noticed that the waters were a little bit warmer. And so it affected their fishing. And so it, the peak of that warmer weather occurred in the December time frame. So December, Christ child, El Nino. So that's where the name comes from. And the full name that they originally gave it was El Nino de Navidad, which is Christ Child again. So that's the origin of the name, but we're, we're not just, you know, in the US. So how does an El Nino weather pattern affect the rest of the world? So as we discussed, upwelling off the South American coast or the Pacific coast in general, that upwelling creates that cold and nutrient dense waters to rise up from the deep and a lot of phytoplankton are present and where there's more fish eating abundant phytoplankton, you got other fish that eat those fish and so on and so forth. So in an El Nino event or an El Nino pattern, that upwelling is drastically reduced. So therefore that cold nutrient dense water is not brought to the surface. 
the photoplankton isn't as abundant and therefore the amount of fish and so on and so forth isn't as abundant. So it does affect fishing communities and all the infrastructure and everything that surrounds that. So a lot of people are impacted, not just in those regional areas, but across the world as well. So now that we've discussed pretty much everything about El Nino, let's do the opposite. What is a La Nina? La Nina has the opposite effect of El Nino in that the trade winds blow westward at a stronger rate causing more than normal amounts of warm water to travel from South America toward Asia. Upwelling increases more than normal, bringing more cold, nutrient-rich waters to the surface of the Pacific coast. The colder than normal waters push the Pacific jet stream further north than its usual position and weakens over the eastern Pacific. Drier than normal and sometimes drought conditions are experienced along the southern U.S., while wetter conditions are felt across the Pacific Northwest and Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Colder than normal temperatures are experienced across western and central Canada, as well as the northern U.S. So as you may have guessed, since this is the opposite of an El Nino, the ocean is different. With those winds being stronger and blowing more of the top waters towards the west, you're going to have more of that cold coming up from the bottom. It's going to bring all that nutrient-rich bottom ocean water up to the top, and you're going to get more things like salmon and squid and different types of ocean life. And as to why it is called a La Nina as opposed to El Nino, well, they figured the opposite was either going to be one of two things. Originally, they called it El Viejo, which means the old man, and then I guess they decided that wasn't opposite enough, so they went with the little girl. They also uh, dabbled in calling it um, anti-El Nino and a cold event. So many different names for La Nina, but these days we call it La Nina. So how often do these patterns occur? So scientists have been looking at this data for a long time and they found that El Nino events actually occur more frequently than La Nina events. And on average, they last about nine to 12 months. Now, sometimes it can extend longer as we've seen from the La Nina event that we're experiencing here in 2022, 2023, it's been going on for quite a while. On average, they last about nine to 12 months and the cycle between an El Nino and a La Nina event can be about two to seven years. So it looks like as we're starting to transition out of La Nina into a neutral pattern, we'll have to see how long we stay in the neutral pattern before we switch to El Nino. And this switching was originally dubbed the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Yep, and because we have an acronym for everything, we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation ENZO. Because why not? <laughs> Everything's got to have a catchy acronym. As scientists, you have to have catchy acronyms. You can have fun somewhere. You can't sleep until you get one. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Noah, Enzo, just, just naming them boy names. <laughs> <laughs> so how does La Nina and El Nino affect hurricane seasons? Well, let's have editing Caleb put up our first image. During an El Nino pattern, more hurricanes are experienced over the eastern Pacific due to less vertical wind shear. Less hurricanes are experienced over the Western Atlantic and Caribbean regions due to more vertical wind shear and increased atmospheric stability. Looking at the next image, in a La Nina event, fewer hurricanes are experienced in the Eastern Pacific due to stronger vertical wind shear, and more hurricanes are experienced in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean due to weaker vertical wind shear and decreased atmospheric stability. As you can see from those two images, El Nino and La Nina are definitely opposing patterns and they cause different weather events. Going back to that earlier image for the La Nina pattern, there's something, um, something peculiar about the jet stream that we see in this image. And for all of our fellow Tornado 11 storm chasers here in Tornado Alley, what does that remind you of? We've got a contrast of cold and warm, mm -hmm. wet and dry, a jet, the position of all those things combined, put mm -hmm. together over a certain location in the United States. What, what could that possibly yield? <laughs> what, what could possibly happen during the spring months, during a La Nina some weather pattern? Let's pop up another image. Here we can see a really cool chart that gives you the frequency of tornadoes and hail and storms as correlated to El Nino and La Nina events. And as we suspected, we can see that there is a higher occurrence of hail tornadoes and supercells in a La Nina weather pattern. Now, this isn't always the case. There are certain 
La Nina events where there's nothing that happens of importance. There are certain El Nino events where it's like, oh, there's tornadoes during this. This is weird. So we're not saying that every single La Nina event is going to produce this outbreak of tornadoes. It can happen all the time. They don't even just happen during the spring. But I wanted to point out some interesting years that were strong La Nina years and you can comment below what may have been special in the Tornado Alley region during these years. These years are 1925, 1974, 1999, 2008, and 2011. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Indeed. For those of you who aren't aware, there are two major super outbreaks of tornadoes that have happened here in the United States. Um, the first one was 1974. The second one was 2011. Now, again, going back to how not every La Nina year is going to produce certain things and certain years that aren't La Nina can produce big tornadoes. You notice that the year 2013 is not on this La Nina year. That was a transition year from La Nina into kind of a neutral pattern and wasn't really too much going on. But if you're familiar with Tornado Alley and big tornadoes, you'll know that that year was the Oklahoma City more EF5. And there was also the El Reno EF3, EF5, do what you will with the numbers. <laughs> the large El Reno tornado. The large El Reno tornado. We'll just yes. leave it at that. Everybody has an opinion on the EF scale, you know, but. Tying that back into how it affects hurricanes, La Nina is what we would expect for a big Atlantic hurricane season. But our biggest Atlantic hurricane seasons, 2020, 2005, 1995, out of all those three, only 1995 was a La Nina event. So again, not every event is going to produce what it should or should not. And it is a topic of research and discussion for atmospheric scientists across the world still today to study these ENSO cycles and how they affect our weather. What's really interesting is that uh, the setup of the pattern occurs over an area where there is not a whole lot of data gathering. You know, out over the uh, Eastern Pacific you know, you don't have land stations, you don't, so you have to rely on satellite imagery, you have to rely on buoys and mm -hmm. ship data, uh, aircraft, so it's not like you have a network that's there right. at this point. In the future, who knows? But, you know, as of right now, trying to understand this takes a while because yeah. you don't have all those data points in play. So there you have it an in-depth dive into El Nino and La Nina events and what they are. Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and be subscribed down below so you never miss the next Meteorology Monday. Follow us over on our Weather Adventures Facebook and Instagram, as well as checking out our website and our School of Weather if you are interested in learning about the basics of meteorology but you're not sure if you want to go to school for it or you don't have time to go to school for it. We have online courses that go into basically what a college level intro to meteorology class is. Also down there, you will find all of the links that we use to put together our video today. And until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday, or Tuesday, or Wednesday. <laughs>